Hi guys, and welcome back to um, episode three of The Catering Cave. As you may have noticed, if you've watched the previous episode, things have moved on a bit. I'm not gonna show you what I've been up to. What I am gonna do is show you the process of installing the engine and gearbox in this episode. Uh, this would be normally a major milestone for anyone building a car and was probably the most daunting task too. Uh, I have installed a few engines in the past. It's been some time since I have and none of them were in a K-Trim. After reading various blogs where people have stated they had two to three people assisting them, I was a little apprehensive myself. Um, the reason being that I was planning on installing this by myself. And to be honest, once it was all over, I did think to myself, what was all the fuss about? As it had taken me just a little over an hour. Little did I know that installing the engine and gearbox was the easy part. Getting the bolts to line up for the engine mounts was the difficult part. It took me far longer than installing the engine and gearbox. So let's have a look what the manual states. So <clears throat> the engine gearbox installation starts on page 42. Uh, the they list the parts required, engine mounts, engine rubbers. Uh, the tools required, uh, engine hoist, is six mil and an eight mil Allen key and a three eighths Allen key. A socket, 13 mil, and a spanner, 13 mil and 15 mil. They provide three tips. Uh, when fitting engine rubbers and mounts, fit as loosely as possible so you can wiggle things to get the bolts in. The second tip, tighten gradually once all bolts are in. Third tip is protect the chassis with soft stuff such as cardboard or a folded towel or blanket. Page 43 gives you a diagram of showing you how to fit the engine gearbox into the engine bay. Uh, also shows you how to uh, fit the engine mounts to the engine and the chassis. Page 44 is for the gearbox installation. Tools required is a 30mm, a 22mm socket and a 6mm Allen key. They provide two tips, the first being once the engine is in, the wiring can be connected to the car's loom. It should be self-explanatory. The second tip, see the IBA guide how to secure the loom. Page 45, uh, similar diagram as they provided in the previous page of showing you to fit the engine and gearbox into the engine bay. Um, with the exception of how to fit the uh, gearbox mount. And that's all that they provide for the installation of the engine and gearbox. And you may be thinking that's not very much. Um, there's a few key things that they haven't quite explained, but I'll get to them shortly. So, before I show you the video, I just wanted to explain. Um, I put a timer in the top left-hand corner of the video. Um, it shows hours, minutes, seconds, and frames. So you can just ignore the last two digits. Um, I also have not edited the video. I haven't cut any part out of it. Um, and the reason for me doing that and putting the timer in, so you can see for yourself actually how long it took from start to finish to get the engine into the engine bay. In the previous episode, I talked about the modification I did to the engine leveler, but I never really showed you the outcome and if it actually worked. Actually, it worked quite well. And only when viewing this video during editing did I realize there was actually one or two links out on the left hand rear chain, but it still worked fine and prevented the engine from twisting while installing it. So if you're watching this to build your own Catrim, I would highly recommend this easy modification. You may notice when moving the engine hoist, it may seem the engine is swaying around quite violently, but in truth, it only appears that way, as the video has been sped up by 500%. So if you wish to watch the video in real time, you can download the video and play it at one fifth of the speed.
Now you are most probably wondering what I'm doing with the laptop when we're meant to be installing the engine. Well, this is where my geekiness was shining through. And seeing that I was doing this all by myself without any assistance, I came up with the bright idea of installing a GoPro camera in the tunnel and then live streaming it to my laptop. And this would be my second pair of eyes in the tunnel. One thing to note, even with the leveler wound all the way to one end, the engine will not be level. And this is due to the pickup points on the engine being designed for the engine without the gearbox attached. And during the final stages, you're going to need to use a jack to get the engine and gearbox into the correct location. In the previous episode, engine preparation, I had used some hose to protect the top front chassis rails, but these didn't cover the full length of the rails and I found during the initial part of the installation, the gearbox did drop and knock on the star section of the top chassis rails, which were unprotected. Because to do this again, I'd use one long piece and not two separate pieces of a hose. Fortunately, it did not make any marks and I just added some duct tape just in case. One thing I did learn very quickly when moving the engine hoist with the engine and gearbox attached is it isn't very easy and especially if you have a floor with a raised pattern like mine. It makes it even harder if you want to make minor adjustments. So my solution to the problem was to use a ratchet strap around the front of the mobile axle stands and attach it to the engine hoist. Now with the sheer weight of the engine and gearbox on the hoist, this prevented the hoist from moving and actually pulled the chassis closer to it rather than going closer to the chassis. This didn't cause any problems, and in fact worked rather well, as the chassis seemed to go over the floor bumps a lot smoother than the hoist. One click of the ratchet was roughly only five millimeters of movement, which was great for those finer adjustments. And if you worried about putting the mobile axle stands out from underneath the chassis, well, I cable tied them to the chassis to prevent this from happening. So you may have noticed that I randomly look at the camera and if you recall from the previous episode the camera overheated and crashed so from time to time I had to keep checking if the red light was still flashing and it was still recording. I chose not to edit this out as I wanted to show you the true unedited time lapse of the install. So the process of installing the engine requires you to tilt the engine to an almost 45 degree angle then lower the tail end of the gearbox into the tunnel. From then onwards, it's a process of pushing it further into the tunnel and leveling it out and then lowering. Well, not pushing it into the tunnel in my case, but using the ratchet strap, pulling the chassis closer. During this time there are two points to watch. Firstly the gap between the gearbox and the top of the tunnel where the ECU is located and the gap between the front of the engine sump and the top chassis rails which form the cross section. And if you're wondering why can't you just load it in at a 45 degree angle and then level it out, well depending on the height of the axle stands there isn't enough room between the chassis and the garage floor. And the other reason is there's a cross member along the bottom of the tunnel and the tail end of the gearbox needs to go above this. Now 
Now while all that is going on, you need to keep an eye on the tail end of the gearbox to ensure it doesn't snag on the heat protection which lines the tunnel, which is where the laptop came into play and saved me having to go back and forth to check the clearance in the tunnel. Was it really necessary? No, but seeing as this was the first time installing the engine and gearbox into a cage room, it was helpful. If I had to do this again, I'd most probably not use it as I found that the polythene bag provided enough protection. However, saying that, I'd most probably just line the tunnel with some thin cardboard, which I could easily remove and not even use the polythene bag. One trick I did find very helpful was to push the engine and gearbox by hand into the tunnel and this helped me gauge how much I could ratchet the chassis closer each time and level the engine out while watching the gap between the front of the sump and the two top chassis rails. One problem I had when lowering the engine via the hydraulic ram, I found myself sometimes over tightening it and then the next time round struggling to loosen the release valve and then all of a sudden the engine would drop. It would be helpful if they came out with a spanner-like tool which would give you more control to loosen the release valve. I think it was around this time that I was almost convinced that the engine wasn't going to fit. Well, what I mean, it wasn't going to clear the top chassis rails. It took a process of elimination what had to be done next. Can the engine be pushed further into the tunnel? Does it need to be leveled out? And can it clear the, the chassis rails so I can lower it more? In the end, the solution was to make smaller adjustments and just keep repeating them. Ratchet in a little bit, level the engine out. Lower it a little, small amount, ratchet in again. Until I realized the cardboard which was protecting the footwells was preventing the gearbox going further into the tunnel as there are two vertical chassis rails in the throat of the tunnel which provide just enough space for the width of the gearbox. So these had to be removed. Now I was a bit slow on moving the camera, but in this move I pushed the engine into the tunnel by hand and lowered it to clear the top chassis rails. As you can see how close the sump is to the chassis, and that's why I do say use rubber hose on these rails and not pipe lagging. Even the thinnest pipe lagging is about 10 mm thick compared to the hose which is only 4 mm thick. You may think 6 mm isn't much. But even with the rubber hose in place, I had my doubts it was going to clear and at one point I was considering removing the rubber hose altogether. I then became a little bit stumped again as to why I couldn't get the gearbox to go further into the tunnel. It turned out the same piece of cardboard I would used to protect the footwells was causing the issue at the front of the tunnel and filing on the bell housing. I think I would have been better off using a thin piece of ABS sheet to protect the footwells the same as I used on the gearbox.
Once the sump was over the top chassis rails, the engine dropped into place very quickly. However, the last bit requires you to jack up the rear of the gearbox, and this is when it looks as if the engine jumps into place. So there you have it, engine in in under an hour. I then proceeded to install the engine mounts and I soon learned that none of the bolt holes in the mounts line up with the chassis. 